It all started one evening in 2009. For one reason or another, I came downstairs where my parents were watching a film in the living room. At the same time I came through the door, another door was being opened on screen, and in walked Natalie Portman in a gabled hood and this beautiful black gown, striding towards an unforgiving semicircle of sour-faced men, whom she stared down and said, It is a sad day for England when nobles do not rise for their queen. My mother quickly explained that this was Anne Boleyn and she was being falsely accused, yet her own uncle declared her guilty and both she and her brother were sentenced to death and beheaded. I'm not sure if it was that line alone that sparked my obsession with Anne Boleyn or just watching the other Boleyn girl for myself on a Saturday night with a cheese toasty. but somehow this one woman who had been dead for centuries had her hooks in me. I was 14 when Anne Boleyn came into my life, and it wasn't a good year for me. Most teenagers don't take puberty well, but I was bullied right up until year 13, or senior year of high school for Americans, and that was only because people were too stressed out with their A-levels to annoy me. Sometimes it baffles me how I found the strength to get up every day and spend six and a half hours in a place that ate away at my psyche. Bullies constantly taunted me, both in class and out, just to get a rise and they made fun of my voice because even though I've lived in the East Midlands all my life, I somehow have a London accent, at least that's as much as I've been told. They mocked the things I liked, touched me without consent and laughed at me when I told them to stop. It made me want to not call attention to myself and it shattered my confidence. I was quite confident when I started secondary school because I was so excited to leave primary school and turn over a new leaf, make a fresh start, and by the time I left secondary school, there was none left. What hurt the most wasn't just the bullies themselves, it was the utter apathy of the teachers who were meant to put a stop to it. Earlier in 2009, I got suspended because when one kid kept touching my knee, I snapped and smacked them because they wouldn't listen every time I told them to stop. And this wasn't the first time I was being punished for standing up to myself, and it wasn't the last. My school arranged for me to go and see a paediatrician every few weeks because some of the heads, the year heads and whatever, were convinced that I was on the autism spectrum. I guess their reasoning was they could blame all the bullying on me if I was indeed on the spectrum and had an excuse to kick me out. The paediatrician said I wasn't, but God, I don't care to imagine how they would have treated someone who actually was on the spectrum if they came into their path. It was a Catholic school, by the way. And you know what the Catholics are like? They'd rather cover up a problem than look it in the face and address it. I'm not saying this as a derogatory attack on all teachers. I know there are some good ones out there and they don't get nearly enough resources for what they have to put up with. But the problem was, at my school, the ones who seemed to be in charge of handling bullying and dealing with students who are miserable were the most apathetic and cruel. From my perspective, they didn't give a damn, and I sometimes wondered how they would have reacted if a pupil had taken their own life, and I thought about taking my own life when I was as young as 13. And let's just say, I'm glad I didn't read 13 Reasons Why at that point. To this day, I find it so hard to trust people because the people I was meant to trust didn't care how I felt. It's taken me years to find my confidence again, but vulnerability literally terrifies me. The only way to cope was to escape into anything I loved. And when Anne Boleyn caught my interest, I spent hours of my free time researching her in books and watched whole movie documentaries and films on YouTube that used to be uploaded in 10 minute segments. Ah, oh, the things you could get away with back then. Not only was Anne intelligent, headstrong and vocal, she met adversity with her head held high. And despite the wave of controversy surrounding her, she stuck to her principles and never gave up. And I loved her for it. I went into school and I tried to be strong like her, though there were times I'd come home depressed and crying, I found a sort of honour in being the outsider. I'm so glad I didn't find out I was bisexual until I got to university, because I think I would have been eaten alive. Keep in mind, this school had the gall to bring in a bunch of dead-eyed young adults to push abstinence at us and use that fucking sticky tape analogy. The one where they compare a girl to a piece of tape that loses its effect and usefulness over how many men 
it attaches to. I'm sure a majority of my former schoolmates weren't homophobic, but I still remember one of them whom I regret to say I had a crush on back in year 7 and 8, using the classic Oh, I'm not a homophobe, but I don't think gays should get married. But he couldn't give a good reason besides shrugging and smirking, and for some reason a few people found that funny, which was just sickening. Nonetheless, Anne Boleyn and studying history in general made me happy at a time when I was really depressed. In February 2010, I finally got to go to the Tower of London for the first time, and the day I went was the most perfect introduction to the infamous fortress. My mother bought off-peak tickets for a Saturday, so our train was at 6am, and we got to Tower Hill just as the Tower of London was opening. There was a thick, eerie fog rising up from the Thames, and because we'd gotten there so early, my mother and I were the only ones in there for at least an hour. So we had the whole tower to ourselves, and walking along the cobblestone entrance past Traitor's Gate, seeing the ravens in their enclosure, buying tat from the gift shops. It was an amazingly atmospheric experience. When the place is packed with tourists, there's usually a longer queue to get into the Jewel House than for a Jacqueline Wolfson book signing at Waterstones. But when we got in there, there wasn't a queue at all, and we could spend as long as we wanted looking at the crown jewels. And when you leave the jewel house, there's a gift shop on the other side, and it sells replicas of famous jewellery from British history. I remember among them was a replica of Diana's pearl and sapphire necklace. And, of course, there was an Anne Boleyn bee necklace, and you cannot imagine how excited I was when I saw that. I literally begged my mother to buy it for me, and luckily she knew how much it meant, and I still have it today. Well, it wasn't built to last over a decade, um, the pearls were stuck onto the plastic hooks, which broke off after a few wears, and then at some point in 2011 the wire broke, so what I had to do was get those drop pearls you find in John Lewis and get some accessories from this local bead shop in Nottingham city centre and I had to fix the necklace myself and luckily my best friend is really good with jewellery making and that's how I got into it. Unfortunately, one does not simply walk into the chapel at the Tower of London where Anne is buried. I was quite grumpy to find it chained off and that was the closest I ever got to her. I would have tried sneaking in, but remember this is the Tower of London, and there was a guy walking around the front bit on the other side of Tower Green with a rifle, and I was like, I do not want to get on the wrong side of that fellow. I went to the Tower again in 2011, but it was the height of summer at the time, and we went later in the day, so while I still had a great time, the immersion was kind of lost. On the bright side, we also took the train all the way down to Hampton Court, and luckily it was so late in the afternoon that we had the immersion there that we didn't get at the tower. Another coping mechanism I had at the time was writing, and I still love to write now, but more on that in a moment. Now this is going to be very embarrassing, so I really hope you don't laugh right now, unless it's in sympathy. <laughs> um, in 2010, I started writing a fan fiction in notebook after notebook. Like most teens writing for the first time, it wasn't perfect. It was just a series of events starring a handful of self-insert protagonists, but I didn't write it to be read. I wrote it just to find some sort of solace. Otherwise, I don't know what depths my mental health would have plummeted to if I didn't have it. It was another thing which attracted bullies at school, unfortunately, and when I was in year 11, or again, sophomore year of high school, my head of year decided the solution was for me not to have my coping mechanism while I was in school. In the fifth instalment of the fic, that is the fifth notebook I filled these stories with. I wrote Anne Boleyn into the story, where not only does she appear as some sort of force ghost, but it's also revealed that one of the main characters is her reincarnation, and the antagonist she's fighting is Henry VIII's reincarnation, and the whole point of the current conflict was Anne's revenge 500 years in the making. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> To be honest, that still sounds like 
a really neat story idea but with better dialogue and less cringy descriptions. I am not going to read any of it because it is too fucking embarrassing and even when I go back to read it I can't make it through five pages without cringing but still. I wrote fan fiction on and off from then on and when I got to university I decided to pursue a bachelor's in English with creative writing. As of now I not only have that bachelor's but also a master's in the same subject. If you guys could follow a link in the description to my Inkit page and have a look at my two stories. One of them is obviously still ongoing, but I'm trying to keep going with that because I love writing. I'd be very grateful if you did that. Um, when I write a protagonist, Anne's influence still has its hold on me. I like writing heroes who are smart and stand up for themselves and pursue their desires. Even if Anne wasn't as unpopular as the Spanish Chronicle and other contemporary Catholic propaganda claim she was, I still find a kindred spirit with her and her legacy. I find it very apt that at the Chateau Ver pageant portrayed in the Tudors and Wolf Hall, Anne played the part of perseverance, because that trait, above all other virtues represented at that pageant, describes Anne best, and knowing now, thanks to Hayley Nolan's Anne Boleyn 500 Years of Lies book, that she was determined to see significant progress in England, even if it meant having to be married to the intemperate Henry, has me rooting for her even more. She was an underdog. And I guess I'm usually attracted to the image of underdogs, and I find something of myself in characters that make bad decisions, that aren't as popular as others, that have to go through long arcs to forgive themselves for their mistakes, that annoy conservatives, that have to find their strength when all hope is lost, that don't simply fall into line and pretend everything is okay when it isn't. I've never lied to myself, and I have no intention of starting now. I decided to make a video addressing this because, even though I'm only a few instalments into this series, we cannot undersell Anne Boleyn's impact on history. I wanted to do right by her. I can't be the only person who feels this strongly about a historical figure, can I? But I found her at a time when I needed that inspiration to keep going. Even in lockdown, sheer bloody perseverance stopped me from doing nothing and letting myself go. Before we go, I just want to mention one more thing. In 2015, in my latter years of being religious, as of 2019, I'm an atheist. I was a camp counsellor at a Christian camp in Pennsylvania, and at the end of the summer, the head counsellors gave each of us a trophy relating to what we had learned and to a certain trait we had shown. They weren't really much, they were just random things spray painted gold with a bit of red glitter on them, to, but I thought mine was quite coincidental. I still have it. Like, how armily coincidental is that? <laughs> I hadn't even thought of Anne Boleyn when that came up, but, but when I started doing this series and I was going through my old things, I looked at this trophy and I realised, hang on a second, perseverance. And just like that, we are finished with Anne Boleyn. <laughs> we have gone through everything I can possibly think of regarding her. And until we get new interpretations of her, then I have nothing left to say, I guess. Again, the trailer for the new series on Channel 5 has come up, and it looks okay. I, I can't really decide how I feel about it yet. I don't really have a good relationship with trailers. Apparently, Anne Boleyn's gonna have a cameo in Kristen Stewart's Diana movie. Okay, <laughs> I don't know how that's gonna happen. Like, does Diana go wandering around the Tower of London one day and meet the ghost of Anne Boleyn, and she's just takes her by the shoulders and say, get out, just just trust me, get out. Or is it like this support group in the afterlife that Anne Boleyn leads that is like a support group for women who have been screwed over by the British royal family <laughs> and <laughs> Diana is the new member. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed it because after a couple of weeks, I'm gonna start with the history of Jane Seymour. And I hope you're looking forward to that because she is definitely someone who is more than meets the eye. And again, please like, comment, subscribe and share this round so it can get a bigger audience. Remember, I'm not going to be doing a rankings video on Henry VIII until I get 50,000 subscribers and I'm not covering Elizabeth I until I get 100,000. So we've still got a way to go.
get subscribing and I'll see you next time. Thank you.